Hello and welcome. You're watching Heartbeat. I'm Andy Hodges. This is ZTN Prime broadcasting to you from our ZTN studios in Harare, Zimbabwe. This broadcast is brought to you by ZTN Prime in partnership with Amnesty International. Now, our topic, a very important topic, ending fistula and restoring dignity in women. It's, of course, Amnesty International. Now, access to proper and affordable sexual reproductive health care is a human right in Zimbabwe, and efforts are being made by both the government and civil society organizations like Amnesty International to ensure everyone, as far as possible, is treated. Now, one of the most serious childbirth ailments that affects many women in Zimbabwe is obstetric fistula. Now, according to health experts, the problem of obstetric fistula in Zimbabwe is prevalent. In fact, 89 women were treated during three campaigns held in Mashoko in March, September and November last year. Obstetric fistula is one of the most serious and tragic childbirth injuries. It's a hole between the birth canal and bladder and or rectum. It is caused by prolonged obstructed labor without access to timely, high-quality medical treatment. And it can be corrected. Today on Heartbeat, we sit down with Amnesty International, who have been and are working on a campaign to end this condition in Zimbabwe. It's time for us to take a breather. Don't go away. Heartbeat. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Heartbeat. This is Etienne Prime, and I'm Andy Hodges. Of course, we're broadcasting you from our studios in Harare, Zimbabwe. This broadcast is brought to you by Etienne Prime in partnership with Amnesty International. Our topic, ending fistula and restoring dignity in women. Now, as I said in preamble, but it's worth repeating, access to proper and affordable sexual reproductive health care is a human right in Zimbabwe. And efforts are being made by both the government and civil society organizations like Amnesty International to ensure everyone, as far as possible, is treated. I now welcome to Heartbeat Amnesty International Zimbabwe Campaigns Coordinator Rosalina Muzerengi and Amnesty International Zimbabwe Membership and Growth Officer Okolo Mashazi. Welcome, ladies. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you no, for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. Very, very important topic we need to discuss today. Um, Nokolo, um, let, me, let me start with you. Let's first uh, sort of understand who exactly is Amnesty International? What do you do? What is your reason for existence, if I can say that? Um, Amnesty International is a global movement. We're present in 150 countries, and we have over 10 million members. So we're not... Um, Partial, we're not politically partisan, and we're not um, fostering any, pushing any agenda of any government. We're funded by our members, and uh, in Zimbabwe, we've held so many researches that influence the influence the campaigns that we do. And currently, during the Women's Month, we're promoting our campaign on SRHR, which is ending obstetric fistula. Mm. Now, when you say members fund you, is this ordinary in the people? Is this uh, organisations? What kind of membership base is that? These are ordinary people across the globe. Like I said, we have over 10 million members. So those mm. are the people that support us financially through membership fees and through donations. So how, how then, if anyone out there wants to get involved in AMC, because you do have various programs apart from Fistula, which we'll talk about with Rose in a bit, but how do people want, if they want to get involved in AMC, get involved in some of your campaigns, get involved in some of your outreach, or even just join the organization, how would they do that? So to take people through our supporters' journey, we encourage them to start off on our social media platforms where they can um, express their interest to become a member. We have also have a link on our website which takes you to the membership registration form. And once you register, we, show, we ensure that we then engage you throughout the campaigns that we hold during the course of the year. And uh, we work with people that are interested in promoting and protecting human rights um, across the sector. It's interesting, this concept of human rights, when everyone uses it, they, they always seem to bring a political element in, but it isn't. This is about is. things like right to potable water, access to health, education, a shelter over your head. These are human rights. Exactly. Mm. And that's, what, that's exactly what we are about as Amnesty International. For instance, today we're going to be talking about obstetric fistula, which is a campaign that we're promoting during Women's Month because it affects women the most. And we also have other campaigns as well. We have the one on ending child marriages where we say 
these are girls, they are not brides, and they should be in school and they should enjoy their lives as children and enjoy their human rights as children. Mm. We also look at uh, abolishment of the death penalty. It's one of the campaigns we look at. And these are issues that come to the fore based on the researches that Amnesty International holds. Rose, um, of course, March is Women's Month, International Women's Month. I always ask why we don't have it the entire year. Okay, I think women should be 365 days a year, not just one month. But anyway, it's nice to then be specific. So where does Amnesty International come in in relation to Women's Month? And also talk to me about this specific program relating to Fistula that you're actually carrying out. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Andy. As Amnesty International, we carry out a number of campaigns. And one of the biggest campaigns that we have globally and obviously nationally is around gender and intersectional justice. So when you look at the issue that we, ha we, are, we are talking about today, the issue about obstetric fistula, it's an issue that mainly affects women and girls in marginalized communities. So we thought this, this month, whilst we are celebrating women across the globe, we could have a conversation around a devastating condition that affects women in, and girls in marginalized communities. So as Amnesty International, we are interested, we are vested so much in women's rights, particularly when you look at sexual reproductive and health rights. And it's one of those, those issues that can be, can be cured, if I can call it that. It can be mended or fixed. And unfortunately, because of that lack of access to high quality health by health care by women in particularly marginalized communities, you may get unfortunate deaths because of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah? Yeah. So how is it, when you say it's treatable, it's easily treatable, is it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Obstetric fistula is, um, maybe, maybe I should start off by explaining what it is, Andy, so, and how it manifests. So obstetric fistula is, um, is an injury that happens at birth. So let me put it this way. A woman's genitalia has got three holes. Okay. So, and the holes are all co are kind of connected. So the major hole is the vagina or the, the birth canal. And the birth canal is connected to yet another hall, which is the rectum. Mm -hmm. And it is also connected to another, another hall, which is the urinary tract system. So th these, these, these walls are connected by a uh, tissue. So in, in, in cases of obstructed labor, these tissues are pressed by the head of the of child, course. creating an artificial hole, uh, another channel via which urine or feces is, is now, it's the channel that is created. And it's an artificial channel. So at the end, at the end of the day, we have a woman leaking feces or leaking urine uncontrollably. So that, that wall that is created as a result of delayed labor or obstructed labor is what we call a fistula. And it comes in two types. Mm. We have the vesicle vaginal fistula, which is the leakage of, uh, of, of urine. And then we have the rectal vaginal fistula where somebody is, is now unable to control their feces. The feces are now coming out through the vagina, which means you can't control them. My goodness. So that, so that will obviously requires surgery of some sort. Is that, is that what it requires to, to, make, to fix that, to fix the, the, the membrane or to fix the... Yeah, yeah. It's very possible to have the, 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 the condition corrected. It's actually not a disease, just a condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just an injury yeah. that happens during obstructed labor. And you find that the Minister of Health and Child Care in Zimbabwe has been carrying out corrective surgeries in Mashoko and, uh, and Chinoy annually with support from the UNFPA and WAHA. It's interesting because you, you, we're talking here about women's sexual reproductive rights and I'm not sure enough research has been done to see whether there have been improvements in those rights. Well, what is your view? Do you think that, that women's rights, particularly when it comes to sexual reproduction, reproduction rights, have been catered for adequately? Um, as an organization, we are a research-based organization. Well, like what uh, my colleague has just said, that uh, before we carry out a campaign on a particular human rights issue, we carry out a research. And the researches that we have carried out uh, point to the fact that women and girls in Zimbabwe do not have adequate access to sexual reproductive health rights, and that is impacting on their day-to-day -day welfare. Particularly when you look at the connection between access to sexual reproductive health rights and this problem of, of obstetric fistula. Explain what you mean by they don't have access. Uh, can you maybe just expand a little bit more? What, what okay. would be required for them to have that, 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 okay. that acceptable access? First of all, uh, um, sec when we look at sexual reproductive health services, the information is not accessible and at times it is not available. 
and uh, you also find that uh, one of the barriers to access that information and services is the taboo or the belief systems that surround access to, for example, condoms, access to any fa family planning methods, yeah. access to information on how, you know, young women and girls can protect themselves from uh, unwanted pregnancies. Yeah. So there's a lot of taboo that surrounds access to those uh, sexual reproductive health services that prevents women and girls from accessing them and that results in them uh, falling uh, pregnant at a tender age mm. and they are at risk of this problem of obstetric fistula. But it also shows that communities, particularly the women in the communities, need to, I, I don't know if the word is stand up, so to speak, to fight for their, their right, if I can call it that. How are you finding the communities, particularly the men, the women, the men in particular, the parochial system, how are you finding them responding to the campaign? Okay, uh, when we look at uh, the campaign around sexual access to sexual reproductive health services, there's been mixed feelings about, uh, uh, about girls and women, even boys, accessing uh, sexual reproductive health rights services because of different religious uh, 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 you know, and traditional beliefs. Because most parents believe that when we promote access to sexual reproductive health services, we are promoting young women and girls to engage in sexual activities willy-nilly. But this is not the case. When you look at the statistics that are coming out, the, the, the media reports that are coming out around uh, sexual activity among adolescents, it's very, very high. We cannot continue to hide behind a finger and say that our mm. children are not engaging mm. in sex. They are indeed engaging in sex at a very, very tender age, as early as 11. And they are engaging not only intergenerational sex, but uh, sexual activity amongst themselves as teenagers. We really have, this is the reality that is on mm. the ground. Mm. And we really need to accept that our children are engaging in sex at a tender age. But at the same time, there are risks that come with lack of knowledge around the impact of engaging in sexual mm. activities at a very tender age. And one of the risks is, the, is, is, is you, you can end up uh, falling pregnant and getting obstetric fistula. And the other risk is you can end up having uh, sexually transmitted mm. uh, d uh, diseases. diseases that can impact then on the right to health of, uh, of, of young people. Nicola, I, I want to talk about diversity because one of the roles that you have is diversity in your membership. And it's interesting to hear what Rose is saying there. Um, how do you see your members contributing to the response? Um, because, again, you know, it's something that is very critical. It does help young girls. It saves lives. You'd think that it's, a, it's sort of something that everyone would want to get involved in because it is so critical. Yeah. So fortunately, we have our membership across all 10 provinces in the country but the clinics that correct uh, obstetric fistula are only in two districts. Mm. So what we then do is to encourage our members to cascade the information, to share the knowledge around obstetric fistula, as well as the information where uh, affected people can access um, the assistance that they need through the Ministry of Health. Mm. Um, we've distributed flyers that have got the toll-free number. We've ass assisted people by telling them that the clinics are available thrice a year. Uh, so what we make sure we do is that we encourage our members to cascade this information and make sure that even in their communities they try and identify people that are affected by this. It's something that happens to someone in their private in their private space. Mm. So a lot of times it's unknown that a person is, uh, is affected by obstetric fistula and it goes untold for a number of years. Mm. So we then capacitate our members, our members to know what fistula looks like, what fistula does, how it affects a person, how it affects the enjoyment of their rights, such that they can identify the people that are affected and assist them from that position, or they can then um, contact us so that we then facilitate their assistance. Mm. Two clinics? I, 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 it's great, it's a start, but obviously I'm sure you'd want to be in all 10 provinces. Yeah, I think uh, when we look at, uh, we acknowledge that uh, there are quite a number of efforts by government mm. to have, uh, you know, uh, two clinics carrying out uh, corrective surgeries uh, during uh, periods of the year. But uh, w uh, it's, it's difficult to say whether the two clinics are adequate or not because we don't have statistics in terms of the actual number of people that, uh, that have... Uh, well, that takes me to, to the two, because you did two research. I mean, you did mention it earlier. What exactly were these researches over and about, and how did you, how did you carry them out? Okay, uh, we carried out two researches between uh, 2017 and 2020. The first research was Lost Without Knowledge, which was focusing on barriers to accessing sexual reproductive health services among adolescents in Zimbabwe. That was the first research. Mm -hmm. And this research inspired the second one, 
which is uh, I never thought I could get healed from this, which was focusing at the abuses that women with obstetric, uh, obstetric fistula face in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So those were the two major researches. Uh, how, how did you carry it out? Did you go countrywide? Did you go district? Uh, how did, how, who did you speak to? The kind of, the kind of um, people and numbers that you spoke to? How, how did it work? Okay, maybe I might not have the actual numbers at the moment, but what we know is that uh, what we did was we engaged the Minister of Health and Child Care. We actually were given permission to go into the clinics, particularly Mashoko and Chinoy, to engage uh, with uh, um, survivors of mm. the condition. So we spoke to the ministry, we spoke to communities, uh, we spoke to people who are affected by the condition. And mm. um, we spoke to the doctors that actually carry out these corrective surgeries to, mm. to give us insights into the experiences, into their experiences at, as med medical practitioners in terms of how they see the impact of uh, obstetric fistula. And, and the challenges and opportunities, were there any that you could specify and say while we're doing our research, we saw these challenges, we saw these opportunities? Okay, I, I think the one of the greatest challenges that uh, we saw as we were carrying out the research, particularly when we look at obstetric fistula, is that there are a number of barriers that prevent uh, women and girls from even accessing the corrective surgery themselves because one, they do not believe that obstetric fistula is an injury that happens at birth and that can be corrected. What do they think? They think it's a disease. They, 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 they think that they've been bewitched. Uh -huh. So we have embarked on a campaign that kind of unpacks the condition and to make people understand that this is a condition that comes about as a result of obstructed labor and we actually encourage uh, peop, uh, young, women and, young women and girls in the event that they fall pregnant, mm. they need to go to a health institution. But what we also found out that the women and girls are at risk of this devastating um, a condition uh, because they shun, you know, uh, modern health uh, facilities. But, but are you talking about the, the, the sort of male-dominated systems that exist in our culture? Yes, it, it's a factor. It's a factor, Andy, uh, because uh, the decision to go and uh, uh, go to a hospital and deliver is actually, that decision does not lie in the woman or the girl. That decision at times lies in the mother-in-law. That decision mm. lies in the church. So you find that there are some churches that believe that uh, a woman does not have to give birth uh, uh, in, in a health institution, they can give birth whilst they are being attended by traditional birth at, uh, mm. attendances. And in the event that there is obstructed labor, these uh, birth, uh, traditional birth attendances are unable to handle the situation. I, I was going to ask you that because obviously a lot of childbirths are done outside of hospitals, whether it's at home or, the, or it's too far away from a hospital, particularly mm. in rural areas. Mm. And so... How do you get around that education of those traditional people giving birth or the midwives to understand how to spot this and do something about it? Because obviously they don't have the medical equipment out there in the huts. They don't have any sort of medicine and so forth. But the woman is suffering and obviously the condition manifests itself through childbirth. How would you do that? Because obviously mm -hmm. you could try and eliminate some of the major causes of the, of the condition. Yes, obviously that lack of knowledge, that lack of information is, is one of the major drivers of obstetric fistula. So what we've been doing as an organization is to come up with a with a human rights education strategy where we are raising awareness around this condition and encouraging people uh, to give birth at health institutions mm -hmm. and uh, to encourage people to say, okay, in the event of an obstructed labor, it is better to go to a hospital and get that attention. But one of the barriers that has been preventing, that has been causing women to shun these health institutions is to do with the cost that comes with giving birth at a health institution. So you would find that a woman or a girl would prefer to give a, a, a birth attendant maybe two liters of cooking oil or a, a bar of soap as payment for the, service that, for the services that they provide because you'd find that in comparison, the cost of going to a hospital is, is, is higher than the cost there, of... There should never be a link between poverty and people dying. It, you know, it's sort of in a way you kind of feel sad that because of money you mm. don't get treated and as a result you could pass away or something tragic could happen to you because, as you said, of the cost. Now, that cannot be acceptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's unacceptable yeah. that at, at, at this day and age we have women with this condition because you find that globally uh, obstetric fistula has been eradicated in most countries and you find that in Zimbabwe we are just amongst the, the few countries that still have this condition. Yeah. Nicole, I'll come back to Rose and continue the discussion, but broadly as Amnesty International, you did earlier mention some of your programs and projects that you're working on. What's the feedback from members? I mean, you know, you, you said you worked on the death penalty, child marriages, we've got this fistula program you're also working on. 
Do you think your members regard the issues you're working on as their priorities? Um, they do, primarily because, like we've already said, this is um, work that's determined by research. So the research is what shows us that a large number of people are affected. And because our members understand solidarity, they understand compassion, and they understand how the what we are promoting is to ensure that everyone is enjoying their rights and we're all enjoying our rights equally. So when we work on some of these campaigns, we really have the support of our members in that they understand where the, where the root cause is, they understand what the problem is, because they are part of the research, is they see the problem, they see mm. where, they, they understand where the problem is taking us. And like you're saying, they understand that some of these uh, affect the lowest people in the communities. So because we work, uh, we work with people at heart, we work, we're driven by compassion. We then work with members that try to make sure that in promoting and protecting human rights, we are all brought to the same level. What I like about your membership is that, unlike others, you who may have one major donor, which of course brings in its own issues in terms of what they want you to do and say, this is members who really just care about people. Really, you and me and our rights, effectively. That's exactly what it is. It's people that understand um, the importance of human rights. It's people that want to protect and promote human rights in their workspaces, in their communities, in the work that they do, in the way that they live their lives. So it's easy for to get support from such people. Mm -hmm. And of course, so you did mention the death penalty. That is one of your major programs to abolish the death penalty in Zimbabwe. And at least the president of Zimbabwe has agreed with that. It's just now, of course, getting it through parliament, I suppose. <laughs> That, that's what we're waiting for. And um, in the meantime, we're making sure that we're raising awareness, we're educating people. Um, we make sure that people understand um, the death penalty from a human rights perspective. Mm -hmm. We understand that um, it's, it, it's not just a punitive measure, but it should allow for, for, for correction. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's support, when, when, we, um, when a person is accused of a crime, we should consider that they also have rights, in as much as we consider the rights of the victims and those that have been violated. Mm -hmm. Well, we will have a longer discussion and another program around the death penalty here with Amnesty International. But it's time for us to take a breather. Our topic, Ending Fistula and Restoring Dignity in Women, Amnesty International. This broadcast is brought to you by ZTN Prime in partnership with Amnesty International. Don't go away. Heartbeat. We'll be right back. They call me Racer X, or in this case, Racer J. Right. Put your seatbelt on. Welcome back. You're watching Heartbeat, and this is ZTM Prime. I'm Andy Hodges. Our theme, Ending Fistula and Restoring Dignity in Women Amnesty International. This broadcast is brought to you by ZTN Prime in partnership with Amnesty International. Now, here we're talking about obstetric fistula, which is one of the most important things that we need to look at when it comes to young girls, when we look at our health system here in Zimbabwe. And it's a preventable condition that can easily be eliminated. In fact, most developed countries have eliminated fistula um, as one of their major programs and one of their major problems, in fact. And Zimbabwe is one of the few countries that hasn't. So third world countries are most at risk. Young girls, young women, and women in general are at risk of course, from this condition. I have here in studio Amnesty International representatives. Rose, um, we were talking before the, the break about the program that you're doing, looking at trying to eliminate or eradicate obstetric fistula in Zimbabwe. Um, you talk, and you did a research, you did a study. Uh, just maybe briefly, just as a recap, what were your major, major findings of that study? 
Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, the major finding, uh, the major findings of our research. Maybe I'll speak to maybe three or four uh, major findings. The first one is that there's a the major findings that there is an intersectionality or there is a relationship between access to sexual reproductive health services, child marriages, and uh, obstetric fistula as a maternal morbidity. Then how does this happen? Mm. When a young girl does not have access to sexual reproductive health uh, uh, services and information and education, they are at risk of falling pregnant uh, before an age where they are actually able to, to withstand what comes with labor. So they, when they do not have access to information around, you know... Their uh, bodies are too young. Yeah, their bodies are too young. Mm. And uh, when they fall pregnant at that age, mm. they are at risk of this condition mm. called obstetric fistula. And uh, we also found out that so many uh, uh, um, uh, 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 communities out there do not know that this condition is actually... Um, a condition that comes about as a result of obstructed labor mm. is an injury that happens at birth and that they, it can be treated and that these are uh, there are you know camps that are available so that they can get this does, does this lead to stigmatization of, of some of the um, victims of this there is condition. a lot there are a lot of human rights violations or human rights abuses that come as a result uh, of having this condition of obstetric fistula one the person loses dignity Dignity is lost because you have got this stain smell that is coming out of you because you are leaking uh, urine mm. or you are leaking feces. Obviously, you tend to you you tend to self-stigmatize. Mm. You cannot go out there and participate in community activities. So issues around freedom of assembly, freedom of association, stigma. You know there are so many issues that you have been bewitched. There are so many issues mm. that come uh, uh, as a result of um, of obstetric fistula. So what needs to be done? I mean, obviously we can say more clinics doing more more uh, more preventive surgery or more corrective surgery but what needs to be done we've spoken education what, what, what is what is Amnesty International's position okay I um from our research we came up with the number of recommendations and what we believe as Amnesty International that the problem of cystic fistula child marriages and sexual reproductive health uh, uh, rights issues they need a comprehensive mm. approach from policy level and practice level so one of the recommendations maybe that I would make as Amnesty International to 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 the government of Zimbabwe they really need to come up with um, with, a, with, a, with a with a with a comprehensive human rights education strategy that ensures that communities are aware of what is available to them mm. with regards to information around sexual reproductive health Because it could just be ignorance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, could, yeah it could be ignorance. And the other thing is that the government really needs to imp to implement the free maternal health uh, policy so that at least, uh, you know, women can have access to 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 to, uh, to maternal health services yeah, free medical and, and of course right. to civil society organizations i think it's it's important that they 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 support government in terms of the initiatives around uh, sexual reproductive health services and information mm. and then to our communities one of the drivers of, of obstetric fistula is child marriages mm. we need to take responsibility as a community to stop child marriages because at, at some point we are found complicit in terms of facilitating child marriages mm. which is one of the key drivers of, of obstetric fistula mm. so it's it, it, it requires a comprehensive we need to all come together as, as a country to ensure that we eliminate obstetric fistula, we promote access to sexual reproductive health services, and we eliminate child marriages as one of the drivers. Oh, you're talking to the converted, yes. Now, um, mm. International Women's Month, of course, it has a theme. What, what is your message for this year's theme as Amazon International 2024? And also, how does this program about combating or eliminating fistula speak? to the international okay. women's theme. Oh, no, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, the theme, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress, resonates with this program of ending fistula and, uh, you know, promoting the dignity of women and girls in Zimbabwe. So when our governments invest in the health of women, they are going to accelerate progress. Because once women do not have access to, to, to maternal health services, to sexual reproductive health rights services, they are going to be affected in one way or the other. So we are saying to our government, please 
accelerate project, invest in women, invest in the maternal health services of our country. I think I can't say it much better than that. Yeah. With that, we come to the end of Heartbeat. I'd like to thank both my guests, Amnesty International Zimbabwe Campaigns Coordinator, Rosalina Muzerengi, and Amnesty International Zimbabwe Membership and Growth Officer, Nokolo Masazi. Ladies, thank you so much for appearing on Heartbeat. It was a very interesting and very important conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy, for hosting us. Now, our topic, Ending Fistula and Restoring Dignity in Women, Amnesty International. This broadcast was brought to you by ZTM Prime in partnership with Amnesty International. You can play your role in Ending Fistula. Let your voice be heard. I'm Andy Hodges. Goodbye, and please, you all be safe.